yes. Okay, let, let's get started. Uh, unfortunately, we are running a little bit out of time. Uh, this is a hardware protection session. So we're gonna talk about hardware security in general. We have uh, three nice papers about differential power analysis all the way down to the circuit. So the first speaker uh, is uh, Galil Barth from iMedia Software Institute. He will be talking about the power differential analysis to us. But, we are still looking for the third uh, presentation presenter in this session, so if you're presenting at the last one, please come to me and see. Okay? Okay, so good morning. Um, is the mic on? Yeah, okay. So uh, this is a joint work with a lot of people, and it's a very distributed paper. As you see, uh, every uh, co-author is in a different place. Also, it was not like this at the time we wrote the paper. And uh, this is about uh, actually applying programming language techniques in order to uh, make uh, crypto implementation more resistant to um, side channel attacks. And uh, in this paper, we're particularly focused on uh, one kind of a side channel attack called uh, differential power analysis and essentially uh, differential power analysis is a side channel attack whereby you are going to measure the power consumption of your implementation and uh, draw some uh, statistical <coughs> uh, kind of uh, deductions from uh, the measurements you've made and from this you can actually uh, recover uh, very efficiently uh, crypto keys and uh, this is actually a very effective effective uh, side channel attack, which uh, uh, poses a lot of problem in the setting of uh, small devices like uh, mo mobile phones or uh, bank cards, but also in a setting of avionics, for example. And uh, so this is uh, something which has received a lot of uh, attention from the uh, crypto community. And uh, so uh, one of the first countermeasure that was uh, proposed in order to uh, fight against uh, this uh, differential power analysis is called masking. It's actually a countermeasure which is inspired from uh, secret sharing. And essentially what you want to do, if you want to uh, protect your crypto key, what you're going to do is you're going to cut it in chunks. And uh, which is uh, what up, what is, uh, I'm not really. Okay, so what's going on here? And uh, more generally, every value that you will be computing, instead of uh, manipulating one value, you will uh, manipulate a probabilistic encoding. And a probabilistic encoding is actually a Pro, uh, tuple of value, x0, xt, and it is a valid encoding of x if when you do the sum of all the share, you recover x, and on top of it, x, each variable is uh, uniformly distributed and they are pairwise independent. Okay, so uh, this is the basic idea. Uh, what you're going to do is instead of computing with value, you're going to compute over this encoding. And so for each algorithm, uh, you will have to come up with an algorithm that computes on this encoding. So how does it work? So for addition, it's actually uh, quite easy. You will just, uh, so this is actually written where each value is represented by three share. So here you have uh, encoding A, which consists of A0, A1, A2, encoding of B, B0, B1, B2, and you have to compute their sum. And so here you're just doing uh, the addition uh, component-wise, and that's kind of easy. For multiplication, it's slightly more complicated. You see here that you're doing the partial products. Here you are doing some random sampling, and then you're doing some kind of computations here, okay? So that's actually uh, the basic idea of masking. For each algorithm, or for each basic operation, you will actually try to come up with an algorithm that performs exactly the same computation, but on this probabilistic encoding. Okay, and it's very easy to sh check, for example, here, that this is 
uh, computing the addition correctly. This is slightly more complicated, but you can check here that this is computing the multiplication correctly. Now the question is like which kind of security guarantee you get. And uh, so um, the standard or the most commonly used model for security of mask implementation is called uh, probing security. And essentially in this security model you have a parameter which is called the security order which actually determines the number of observation the adversary can do. So uh, here I'm uh, choosing uh, some order T. And essentially uh, in this probing security model executing one instruction will actually leak some information. It will actually leak uh, the value which is written in memory. So if you're in a state sigma and you're executing this assignment here, x receives e and leads to a set sigma prime, what you're actually leaking is the value of the expression in the original memory. And uh, then uh, when you have a sequence of observations, so here each observation is a program variable. So for the sake of it, you can assume that the program is in SSA form. So uh, you have a complete execution and what will be leaked is the sequence of values of this expression at the particular program point where they were evaluated. Okay, and uh, so I use this uh, notation here for the leakage uh, with respect to a tuple of observation. And uh, the notion of probing security is essentially saying, well, the adversary can pick its up to t observations. So these are this program variable x1, xt. And then the program is secure if for every adversarial choice of observation and every two equivalent inputs, sigma 0 and t0, the leakage are equal, okay, as kind of distribution. And um, the basic idea here is like your secret are uh, kind of uh, encoding in your input and the uh, inputs are equivalent if you encode the same value, okay? And uh, so uh, what uh, we want to achieve is uh, actually uh, programs that achieve this notion of probing security. And uh, why is uh, this notion of uh, probing security meaningful? So if you're a practical guy, maybe you're going to say, oh, maybe this model is really weird. Why does it correspond to uh, measuring uh, power at all? Okay, and uh, very fortunately for us, we don't have to care about this because um, uh, this uh, notion of uh, probing security is just only one of the models uh, that is uh, used to uh, reason about masked implementation. There are other models like the noisy leak model that was used and there was a paper at Eurocrypt 2014 by uh, Duke, uh, Zimbowski and uh, Faust uh, who actually uh, proved that uh, these uh, two models are equivalent. So essentially uh, there is a more uh, practical model, this noisy leakage model where actually all assignments are leaking but are leaking with noise and this is a more realistic model but by, by this Eurocrypt 14 paper we know that it's sufficient to look at this probing model. Okay. So uh, this also uh, gives us some very strong guarantee because essentially uh, what probing security uh, says is like uh, uh, if you're looking at the leakage, actually the leakage can be uh, simulated with a smaller a number of share on each input. So essentially uh, for each uh, tuple of leakage you can take the inputs minus at least one of the share and with this you can actually uh, simulate the leakage. And because uh, the way encodings are set up, uh, it actually means that uh, you will not learn anything from the secret uh, because of this notion of simulatability. And uh, finally, which is uh, the great thing for us, is like it, con it connects very well with language-based security. So language-based security is a, a very established field in uh, uh, programming language where people try to apply programming language techniques uh, to ensure that programs are secure. And in fact, pro probing security is actually equivalent to uh, probabilistic non-interference for all tuples of observation. Okay, so this is very good because uh, we can now try to use the tools of a programming language in order to um, show probing security. Now there is a big issue with this. Uh, probing security is actually very hard. You have a two-dimensional explosion. First, when you have to verify a single gadget, which is the kind of algorithm I showed on the previous slide for doing addition or multiplication, uh, 
you actually have a lot of verification to be done because it has to be done for all types of observations. So for addition, it's easy, but for multiplication, it gets more complicated. And uh, the other problem actually comes up with composition. So let me try uh, to tell you uh, both of the dimension. Uh, in the course of this paper, we will mostly focus on composition, but uh, it's important to understand what goes on with individual gadgets to understand the need for composition. So uh, a naive approach, uh, if you uh, decide to verify probing securities, like you have to prove probabilistic non-interference for every subset uh, of size t of um, um, variable, and uh, so you can just try to do this, but there are lots of tuples. Some are easy, some are harder to check, and it's very easy to make mistakes. Okay, just to uh, give you some example, these are uh, some uh, algorithms uh, which have, um, and their mask implementation. Uh, this is the number of observation the adversary is allowed to do, and you see that uh, for a, a full IOS at a first order, you only have a kind of uh, 17,000 tuples to uh, check, but then when you go to much smaller component like S-Box, when you go to, let's say, for example, um, uh, third order, you have over 2 million, and uh, so, I mean, this is uh, something that, uh, well, actually, more, much more than 2 million. This is uh, something that grows exponentially, so uh, it is actually not really uh, feasible to go and check each uh, tuple individually. So what we had in a Eurocrypt 2015 paper is a kind of fully automated method to actually check probing security for individual gadget at reasonable order, so reasonable order is something like less than six, but it actually does not scale to full implementation because the number of tuple you would have to check is just huge. So um, what you have to do is verify gadget individually and come up with a compositional approach. Okay, which means that uh, um, you really have to understand how you combine your gadget. Now, the problem with composition is like uh, non-interference uh, in the flavor considered here, this probing security, is actually uh, not compositional. So you cannot really take uh, two probing secure uh, gadget and combine them together. If you do this, you get something which is insecure. And the problem actually comes from the fact that there are some values that can be used more than once, okay? And so the kind of standard solution to solve this problem is to use a so-called refreshing gadget. So refreshing gadget is something that takes an encoding and uh, for some value and uh, produces another encoding for the same value, so it doesn't change the, the value being encoding, but it kinds of uh, introduces some entropy and breaks the probabilistic dependency. So this is actually, for example, how you can do an additive refresh, again on three share, you just sample two value and you just uh, add uh, value you've been sampling to the first chair, another value you've been sampling to the second chair, and then you just uh, fix the uh, third chair in such a way that you get uh, the required result, okay? So I'm working in the field of characteristic two here, which means that addition and uh, subtraction are the same, so things uh, are lined up. Now, uh, there are some issues with uh, this uh, strategy of uh, adding refreshing gadget. The first issue is like, actually, if you add refreshing gadget, it does not guarantee that you achieve, secu achieve security. And on top of it, every time you add a refreshing gadget, this has a cost. Okay, because you're doing random sampling. Random sampling are expensive. So the, you, you have this kind of uh, two problems. Uh, it does not guarantee security and it, it might add some cost. And so you would like to find a way to uh, solve this. So let me try to uh, explain in slightly more detail why actually uh, security is not preserved. So uh, let's look at this uh, very um, uh, simple uh, situation, so we have four gadgets, and uh, we want to prove uh, probing security at order t, and uh, we know that each of the gadget consider is probing secure. Okay, and uh, so here I have not mentioned, but it could be the case that one of these gadgets is a refreshing gadget, which is uh, uh, still uh, probing security. Uh, probing secure. Okay, so how does it go? Well, uh, we are the adversary, so we have to pick up to T observations. Okay, so we're going to pick a T0 for A0, T1 for A1, T2 for A2, and T3 for A3. 
And uh, we want to show actually uh, that uh, this thing is probably secure and uh, we'll see why we fail. So I'm going to use here this uh, simulation-based notion, which is equivalent to um, uh, probing security in order to explain the problem. The problem. So um, we know that, um, okay, so we, we know that uh, this uh, thing is uh, actually uh, probing secure. So what we can actually do uh, by simulatability, we can actually take this observation and push them uh, to some observation uh, on the output of A2 and observation on the output of A1, okay? So uh, this means that uh, now uh, we have uh, to simulate T2 plus T3 observation uh, from A2 and T1 plus T3 observation from A1. Again, we use the fact that um, this uh, A2 is uh, simulatable, so we are actually uh, going to push this T2 plus T3 observation from A2 to A1, and then we get uh, T1 plus T2 plus 2T3 observation, and then in order to do the final step, we would need to know that uh, T1 plus T2 plus 2T3 is uh, smaller than T, but this is actually not the case because, or we don't know whether it's the case, because our constraint only says that that uh, uh, T0 plus T1 plus T2 plus T3 is smaller than T. Okay, so we are stuck. And uh, so uh, what is the, um, okay, so actually you get exactly a similar problem if you insert a gadget and you assume a gadget is any, non-interfering. So what we actually come up with is a stronger notion of non-interference, which actually supports compositional reasoning. And the basic idea here is like uh, we are going to distinguish between uh, internal observation. So this actually uh, corresponds uh, to uh, assignments that occur in the body of the program. Uh, and uh, external or output observation, which are value, which are directly output by the algorithm. And uh, this distinction allows us to have a fine grain uh, notion of uh, probing security. So essentially now we're splitting the uh, intermediate observation between internal variables and output variable. And what you require is like uh, for every such set of size t, you can actually simulate it with at most t1 share for each input, where t1 is the number of internal variable. So if you have actually a, a gadget which achieved this notion of uh, a strong non-interference and uh, you have to do the simulatability proof. What actually happens is like when you hit a T, uh, a strong non-interference gadget, you actually uh, kind of forget about all the observation that you've been carrying uh, in your simulation and this is actually what allows you uh, to have uh, compositional reasoning go through. Okay, so here now let's assume that this gadget here, okay, is actually uh, strongly non-interfering and let's play the game again. Uh, so uh, we are uh, pushing back the observation from T3 uh, back to A2 and to the refreshing uh, gadget. So now uh, we have uh, still T2 plus T3 observation on A2, but on the refreshing gadget we have a TR internal observation plus T3 output observation. And now using the fact that the refresh gadget is a TSNI, we can push it back and uh, you see that we get uh, now only the TR, the second uh, T3 does not uh, show up, okay, and uh, we can actually pursue and uh, uh, we get uh, the right constraint here. We get something which is smaller than T, okay? So this is um, um, very uh, useful notion for conducting uh, compositional reasoning. And uh, the good news about it is that uh, it's also a notion which is non-vacuous. It actually happens that there are many uh, algorithms from the literature that achieve strong non-interference. So here I show a refreshing gadget that satisfies a, non, a strong non-interference, but uh, you also have addition gadgets, uh, sorry, multiplication gadgets uh, that achieves a strong non-interference. And uh, so uh, that means that uh, this is actually quite a reasonable notion. 
Okay, and on top of it, it has some nice closure properties. So for example, if you take a non-interfering gadget and you post-process its output with a strong non-interfering refresh gadget, you get a gadget which is a strong non-interfering. And likewise, if you take a non-interfering gadget and you pre-process its input with a strong non-interfering gadget, a refreshing gadget, you get something which is strongly non-interfering. Okay, so um, we have uh, easy ways to uh, make something uh, strongly non-interfering in case uh, we decide to do it. And uh, okay, so um, in order to uh, try to motivate slightly more um, the usefulness of strong non-interference, we can look at the implementation of the AES S box. It's a masked implementation. Uh, we're using a refreshing gadget here, multiplication gadget here. And uh, it actually uh, is the case that a first implementation of this uh, gadget was actually insecure because uh, the refreshing gadget that was uh, actually used here was non-interfering but non-strong, non-interfering. And so there was an attack on this implementation of AES uh, S-Box. Now, if this refreshing gadget is actually strong non-interfering, then it's actually possible to show by playing the simulation game going backwards, uh, which I showed before, that this gadget is uh, uh, strong non-interfering. Okay, it's strong non-interfering because we are assuming this multiplication here is strong non-interfering, so the overall result will be strong non-interfering rather than non-interfering. And the last thing, which is a kind of uh, very interesting, as well. It's kind of a design choice when you're implementing mask implementation. You can actually uh, combine SNE, uh, strong non-interfering and non-interfering gadget to improve efficiency. And so there is a paper at Eurocrypt by a uh, number of uh, people uh, who actually uh, use this uh, notion of strong non-interference and uh, in combination with uh, weaker notions of multiplication to achieve a greater efficiency. So we see that the strong non-interference supports more security, but uh, also more efficiency. And uh, okay, so um, in the paper we um, explain this uh, notion of uh, strong non-interference, but our original motivation was actually uh, to come up with a tool that takes uh, some implementation and uh, automatically outputs a masked uh, implementation. And so for this, we were actually able to use a lot of um, programming language techniques, and uh, so what we implemented is a, a certifying masking transformation, which takes a program written in a reasonable subset of C, and actually automatically outputs a mask implementation. And uh, so we're using uh, something uh, called information flow type system, which is uh, uh, widely used in language-based security. It's uh, a bit strange because uh, we use abstract set and cardinal uh, with uh, cardinality constraints. So it's kind of non-standard due to the fact that we have to uh, verify cardinality constraints over all uh, tuple, but uh, it's uh, pretty neat. And uh, one thing which is very nice as well is like we have a type inference algorithm which actually tells us where to insert this uh, mask refreshing gadget. Okay, so we uh, achieve um, reasonable efficiency this way. And uh, so these are uh, some uh, examples of uh, algorithm uh, which have been uh, fed to our tool, and uh, you see that it takes full implementation like AES, Ketchak, and some of these uh, uh, more uh, lightweight algorithm like uh, Simon and Spec. And uh, then uh, we've been uh, running uh, this algorithm, I think, uh, what I'm a different order. And uh, I think what I'm showing here is the execution time for about 10,000 execution of each algorithm. And 
probably the most uh, important message uh, to take away from this is that uh, the algorithm that uh, we actually get automatically, they are competitive with a handwritten implementation. So we have a fully automated tool uh, that uh, uh, allows you to get uh, efficient implementation. And then we can really go to others where if you try to do this by hand, it's going to be hopeless. Okay. And uh, so uh, to conclude, we have um, uh, been uh, developing a new compositional notion for probing security. So this notion of strong non-interference is actually uh, quite useful and has already been used in a number of papers in Eurocrypt, as I already mentioned. But in uh, chess this year, this is uh, several people have looked into this. We have this uh, type-based um, uh, analysis and masking transformation, and uh, which works pretty well. And uh, there are many uh, interesting directions for future work, like synthesizing gadgets, try to improve implementation, and look at other more complicated models. Thanks for your attention. So if you have any question, two mics are left and right of your side. And please tell your name and affiliation before asking question. So let me start asking a very naive question. Uh, could you tell, tell us about your motivation a little bit more? For like, technically it seems very appealing. But for a software developer like me, uh, is that the something that we have to worry about? Uh, for example, when I'm invoking some AES instruction in Intel CPU, uh, so whether you would have to worry about uh, DPA uh, attacks, is it yes. your question? I think a lot of people worry about this. Um, one of the uh, co-authors is actually working in uh, Thales uh, Security, which is a, secu uh, I mean a security company, and they care very much about this. Uh, I mean, for me, I just saw a nice opportunity of applying uh, language-based uh, techniques to this uh, problem of uh, DPA attacks. But I, I really believe DPA is a serious problem. Uh, there's a, I mean, a community of people working on this. And uh, with, I mean, uh, for whether you're using AES instruction, I think now that I, it depends very much in the setting in which you're looking. I mean, you have hardware instruction for AES, for example. Okay, yeah, if you don't if we don't have any questions, uh, let's thank our speaker once more.